director of IPD. But uh, uh, for me today is uh, a very special and likely dialogue because we have uh, very good friends coming from Sweden, coming, coming from Ukraine. And the, the one who has made this possible is my colleague and friend, Jaime Moreno. And I prefer Jaime to do the, the introduction because he deserves all our uh, respect because he is doing an incredible job to make possible uh, what is happening this week here in Madrid and from Thursday in, in Valencia. Um, thank you, Jaime, for, for, for making this possible, for doing this possible. And thanks to our colleagues coming from, from Sweden and, and Ukraine, and especially to, to Olga Kodras. Thank you so much, Carlos. And I have to say that uh, the pleasure is mine. The only merit that uh, I have is just enjoying enjoying the, the opportunity to be with, with incredible people. And uh, one of those people is uh, Olga Cordas. She is the director of Viral City. For those uh, you know, you don't know, is the Swedish uh, platform. It's really um, a very well established and a very innovative program within uh, Europe, really fostering uh, collaboration, multi stakeholder collaboration, multi level collaboration uh, in the endeavor to get uh, climate neutral cities. And um, she's a associate professor from, from KTX, and uh, we will have the, this great opportunity to learn uh, more about uh, viable cities and all the. Uh, ideas and frameworks that uh, we share with uh, with them. And also we have the great opportunity to have uh, many Ukrainian colleagues coming from different universities and, and other uh, organizations also engaged in this uh, endeavor of uh, addressing climate issues and uh, very uh, important and, and relevant task of, of uh, rethinking the rebuilding of, of the country with this uh, paradigm. So uh, we will have a, a session with, with two parts. We will start with, uh, with a kind of keynote from Olga, and then we will have uh, another half of the session uh, dedicated to hear from Ukrainian experience, and, and we will have a, a quite distributed and, and diverse dialogue. Uh, and I would like to finish my intervention by asking uh, Julia Lumbrera to give a very, very few words. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> because uh, he's been uh, for us the our uh, own Olga. Uh, so um, and uh, he's coordinating Cities 2030, the uh, Spanish sister program to Viable City. And, and just, yeah, uh, we wanted to, uh, to give like 30 words. So I think we <laughs> don't need more than what you said. So only maybe one sort of thing that we, well, you know, Olga, but we are so thankful to your inspiration, to your example, because if we are here working in Spain with 17 cities and expanding this work to transform our cities is thanks to to your inspiration and to your example. So uh, it's just some words to, uh, you know, foster your attention. And, and if you are tired or whatever, it, she deserves this time because she, you will learn a lot from these 30 minutes. And of course, from the Ukrainian colleagues that will come later, but we are more than happy to collaborate with you. We are very thankful and we are looking forward to continuing this fruitful collaboration. So thank you for coming to read to this center the first time and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Carlos and Jaime and Julio. So I'm so privileged now to be here in Madrid and uh, thank you for the opportunity to to make a short speech uh, to you and also great thanks for your hospitality and for great days that we have here with uh, all the Ukrainian team of the Initiative Project. So as 
you've heard. My name is Olga Kordas and I am a Swedish Hulu. Uh, so uh, yes, I'm coming originally from Ukraine. I am living now in Sweden for 22 years. And uh, so I graduated from Tarashevchenko Cave University. And uh, so my PhD in complex system sciences. But when I moved to Sweden, I started to be interested in also in innovation studies. So in transition management, so my research and also work of Iowa cities is uh, like around the question, how can we initiate or accelerate a sustainability transition or systems transition in our cities? So that's, that's a question of uh, both the program and also my research group at KTH, which is called Urban Analytics and Transition. In my research group, I have uh, uh, researchers in the field of um, applied mathematics, mathematical modeling, uh, but also researchers from social sciences and innovation studies. So it's a transdisciplinary research group. And you know, might be it's different in Madrid, but it's not so easy to have uh, transdisciplinary research groups. So it's much better to have, okay, whether you're doing modeling or you're doing social sciences. And when putting this together, you have both like scientific problems, ontological, epistemological, but you also have organizational problems and issues. So, but we, we are managing well. Uh, I'm also like the head of uh, Hulu in Sweden. So I'm director of Bible Cities. And, uh, I will talk about the strategic innovation program uh, that I am leading in, in Sweden. Uh, I'm trying to change the slides. And uh, yeah, so just a few words. Uh, strategic innovation programs in Sweden is very something very special. I think the, there are not so many countries in the world that have similar organizations or similar investment into research innovation as uh, in Sweden. So strategic innovation programs means that uh, the different actors in society can come together, self-organize and apply, uh, describe a strategic innovation area as for example, uh, climate neutral and sustainable cities, and then explain why it's important to invest into research, innovation, implementation in this area. And then you could apply it for governmental funds. In Sweden, there are 17 strategic innovation uh, programs uh, and viable cities, we are the youngest one. We started with 2017. The good things with these strategic innovation programs is that we both have money to, uh, to, uh, for strategic intelligence to develop, for example, mission-oriented uh, approaches, methods, and tools uh, to design urban experiments. But we also have money to invest into these urban experiments. And this is very, very kind of, uh, I think that fortunate and also unusual. So there we have both. Uh, so we are long-term program, which is also good helping us uh, from 2017 to at least 2030, so 12 years. And uh, so we have, we are member organization so we have now 130 members plus and they are coming from the quadruple helix from uh, public authorities uh, municipalities regional authorities national authorities we have universities research institutes we have companies from different sectors energy mobility construction uh, it and so on and also we have civil society organizations on different levels uh, we are pioneers together with Cities 2030 of so-called mission-driven innovation with a mission of climate neutral Cities 2030 with a good life for all within planetary boundaries. And I will say a few words about that. And then we have a budget of uh, approximately 150 million euro. So that's a budget that goes both into the strategic intelligence work and also into funding urban experimentations. So I would say, yeah, so it's not bad. No, yeah. So it allows us uh, to work uh, impactfully. Uh, so this is a very small uh, kind of pictures. So this kind of logos of all different uh, uh, or major partners here. So you could see uh, my university, the Royal Institute of Technology, is uh, is a coordinator, and this I think that it's important to. Uh, to think and understand that viable cities is really bottom-up initiative. 
So it came from uh, the times when I was a director of energy platform at KTH. And then we've got ID. So should we connect different researchers around this topic? So it was nothing. It was just like no money and nothing. So we just like came several researchers and started to think, okay, what are the interesting questions and development questions? Who are our partners? Which municipalities we're working with? Which company we're working with? So we brought together 20 organizations, designed the program, applied for the program and developed the program. So, and then I think that in that we are very much similar to ITD and Cities 2030. So it's nobody told us you should do that. Nobody told us you will have money for that. So it just, it came from the understanding of the needs of the society. Uh, yes, and the mission, uh, probably you've heard about this many, many times. Uh, so, so, you know, about like Mariana Mazzucato, saying that, okay, so we now need to have another type of investment in the research innovation, because with all the projects we have, all fragmented projects with Horizon Europe, with Horizon 2020 at that time, uh, with all the national funds, we do a lot of projects. We are very good to innovate, especially technical solutions. Our problem is that we have societal challenges. We had them before, we have poverty, we have climate change, we have all the crises. And with all the investment into research innovation, we are not near to solve our program problems and challenges. We know that like recent reports on sustainable development goals, we are not like sustainable development goals by 2030. We are not even near to reach the targets of 2030 with all the uh, in, uh, with all the investments. And the idea for the mission-driven innovation is that instead of saying, okay, we are solving societal challenges, then we have a visionary and concrete objective. And then we have broad perspective. And then this is in order to, uh, yes, to bring together different uh, actors, different disciplines, and in order to inspire and provide directionality, intentionality. Uh, to kind of to, to reach the to reach the goals. Um, so and this is inspired by Apollo mission. Within 10 years, we should put a man place a man on the moon. And the transparency of it is just like in 10 years, you know, are you there? Like, do you have a man on the moon? If you don't believe in all the conspiracy theories, <laughs> then you, you might then believe, okay, so are we doing well? I mean, and then you could be very transparent also. Um, so for the taxpayers who also invest in the research innovation said, okay, so what we've done. Um, so our mission within Bible cities, as I already mentioned, is climate neutral cities by 2030 with a good life for all within planetary boundaries. And this is very much in line with European mission. But I think the one clear thing here is that we are connecting climate transition with social sustainability. This is like good life for all is very important. It's not only like, okay, so now we are working on the emission, how we can decrease the emissions of CO2 and uh, uh, so and work with climate mitigation. But the question is, how do we provide other values, these societal values? And also it's about planetary boundaries because now, now everybody are talking about electrification. If only we could electrify all the cars there, but what about materials? And what is about other planetary boundaries? So kind of how can we have all the kind of all the different targets in, in our head? It's not easy. And I don't think we have answer. I don't think here you, you have answer. But working together, we, we are bringing like some, some more clarity of this problem. And now we also know all of us and probably feel it in many different ways that we are living in uh, times of multiple crises and we are very close to poly crisis where we have like all these cascading crises of uh, like from pandemic to the war in ukraine to the climate to climate change to financial problems uh, and so on and so forth so we we, we see uh, that uh, the many countries in europe and in the world the mental health issues are escalating so, and then all these cascading effects when one crisis 
an energy crisis and one crisis in bringing with it and like multiplying the other crisis. So we need to be able much better to have many, many targets in our heads. So we cannot solify, like have a silo solutions, which, which makes our lives a little bit, even if you have budget for innovation program. So that's, we have very, very hard times. So with this mission, we are playing on different levels or working. So in Sweden, we are working with 23 cities representing 40% of Sweden's population. And those cities are from the north to south and from the east to west. Uh, and those cities are cities who have a high ambitions to become climate neutral faster than others. On Europe, in European level, we are working with the Net Zero platform with 112 cities in Europe that have these high ambitions. And with the Net Zero cities, we are collaborating, of course, with uh, Cities 2030 and with the great colleagues uh, from Spain. We're also working globally. Um, there we have less, uh, I would say, like maybe less um, interventions, but one very interesting one, which is called Climate Smart City Challenge. We're working together with UN Habitat and we develop, designed a new type of uh, uh, effort, which is called um, systems demonstrators, where it's a large, large investment programs, like with if, like from research to innovation to implementation and to upscaling. Um, so, and this is like we're experimenting with that in several cities as for example, Bogota or Curitiba. So, and it's very important for us to be able to be on those different levels from local to regional to national and to, to European and to global. Yeah, so this is maybe a little bit better picture Probably you've never heard about most of the cities uh, in this uh, table, but uh, but maybe what is important to know about the cities is the cities are like very of different sizes. Actually, in Sweden, those three largest cities, and actually, if you think about city definition of how many people we are, so it's only three cities. So we have in Sweden only Stockholm, Gothenburg, and Malmo. All others are like municipalities with uh, fewer people. Uh, but then, so we are working with the large cities and also with small cities. Sometimes we've heard that, okay, small cities has very hard times to keep high ambitions because of the capacity, capability, because of number of people there and so on. But we have uh, our smallest one is called Maria Stadt, and it's only 25,000 uh, people, but they are very, uh, like high ambitions and they are doing a lot and they reached uh, rather interesting results and they are leading in some of the developments in, in the whole suite of. so and we are having now plans and our question is how do you scale up from 23 cities to 290 or, uh, or 23 municipalities to 290 municipalities because we cannot work, this is our like working method, how we work with 23 cities would not work with 290. So this is a kind of our big question. If you know answer, you know whom to, <laughs> you, whom to address. Yes, and when we work with cities, so there are several shifts that we need to address. And this one is how we create in cities a portfolio of interventions of multiple scales. So not only working on products or services, but also work on product services, policies, narratives building, funding, financing, culture, behaviors, and so on. So how can we create those kind of multiple portfolios? Then also, how do we uh, bring the change uh, across mul multiple levers of change, culture, governance, finance, and so on. And also, how do we create the solutions that could bring different the range of outcomes? So not only carbon reduction, but also nature restoration, social justice, and so on and so forth. 
and then uh, also how can we create the coalitions for change? So a new strategic reframing of the program uh, problems. So how we bring all the different uh, stakeholders that we need, uh, how we create tools for multi-level governance from local, regional to national levels, because we know that municipalities uh, cannot do many things themselves. Also, how we can create those kind of new relationships in the system. So it's not only a competing, but also collaborating and how this could be done. Uh, so also we see huge potential, but we need to find out how is uh, this um, exploratory experimentation. How do we do those experimentations to open new possibilities, but also have a directionality of climate neutral cities? how we can change the balance of power and agency. So, so we know like where power layers are and uh, how agency is distributed. So how can we change that or try to do that? Then how can we build in learning and adaptation with what we are doing? Because normally as researchers, even so we, we need, like we are learning all the time, but what we are doing, we are getting a lot of projects and then we are running and jumping from one project to another and we don't have time to reflect. And the same thing is done by municipalities. So they are doing their work and there is no learning and reflection time for that. And also how can we mobilize investment? So how can we invest in the change of such a huge scope and scale that we've never seen before? So those are questions that we have and those shifts that we need to bring into society. And it's, it's a lot and it's not easy. Uh, so if you want to remember one thing from, from all this long list, then maybe this one is important and it's about a portfolio of initiatives uh, targeting the mission instead of fragmented projects and solutions. If you ask any city of Sweden, and especially those larger cities, what are you doing in, for example, in climate transition or for social justice? They even don't know. And then if, when they start to list, they don't know how those different interventions are interconnected, how they could cross fertilize, how do we make learning of everything that we are doing? Uh, so, so how can we design our program with ideas of beyond projectification and how can we accelerate the learnings between all these different um, uh, efforts that we are doing. So that's a big, big thing that we are working on. And one uh, findings that we've done or innovation, so we created what we are calling Bible Cities Transition Lab. And this is a lab for co-creation and reflexive learning. So when we Actually, maybe uh, one difference between Cities 2030 and Viable Cities is that, as I mentioned, we have possibility to fund our cities. So we create, uh, so we are doing calls for proposals and cities with highest ambition that we saw this 23 cities, they are getting funding to work with us. But then they are getting funds not only for their experimentation and work, designing the pathways and doing the exper experiments and piloting things, but they also must have part of the budget to participate in this transition lab and the co-creation activities. So they must do it, which means that it provides them also to give them external mandate. So they, they participate in this co-creation with other cities. So that's, uh, that's very important, especially in times when uh, city budgets uh, are very tight now, then sometimes cities say, that, okay, we cannot participate in many kind of uh, creative uh, efforts um, or developing efforts because we need to do day by day work, but they can do, work together with us because they have funds to do that and this external mandate. 
So, so we are designing within this transition lab, we are designing the tools for multi-level governance and climate city contract. We are doing transformative portfolio creations together with cities. We are de developing methods for climate investment planning as also you are doing here. Uh, and this is to clarify the common direction, to take advantages of the synergies, the new decision-making and pol policy and building capacities and capabilities in cities and their partners to, to run the change. And also the same way as Cities 2030, we are working both with civil servants in, in municipalities, but we are also working with politicians. So I'm meeting mayors I'm, in many cities. I'm meeting both majority and opposition because in order to make, I mean, when uh, after the election, so to make this question of viable cities and the mission not polarizing. So meeting both majority and, uh, and uh, the um, opposition. And we had the election last year. We changed the government uh, from left to right um, on the national level. But it's interesting that on the local level, most of our cities who had the right right uh, uh, government they change to left so it's uh, and it's interesting also the kind of this dynamic between national level and local level is very interesting um so but uh, but in several municipalities it was like different change uh, most of our municipalities actually change the, the majority uh and in several of municipalities our the civil servants they called us saying okay now you need to come in, to our cities and talk to our politicians because they are unsure whether they continue to work uh, on the on the mission. And then we were there, and uh, so it was really good. Um, I think that uh, all politicians were telling us that okay, we are enlightened, we are positive, so we continue. Maybe they change; they have different opinions about how, but at least all the municipalities are state. Uh, and they are, they continue to participate. So on local level, I think it's much easier for us to work and then on the national level. It's, it's always place-based. You care about your cities. You want the cities good. You think, okay, so it's climate transition, but also social values. So this narrative is helping on the local level, not on the national level, unfortunately. And one of the creations that we are also working with is a climate city contract commitments from the mayors, uh, also action plans, investment plans, commitments in Sweden. It's also commitments on the national level. So the six, six uh, national authorities in Sweden are signing climate city contracts uh, and also commitments from viable cities. So we bring different actors together with uh, one mission of to become climate neutral. So, and this tool for us working very well. Uh, the interesting uh, with us is that our climate city contract is re-signed every year. So it's not a document, it's a process and process is more important than the document. So 23 mayors, six director generals of national authorities, and me every year we're designing the climate city contract. Then it gives us possibility to develop further both commitments, action plans, investment plans, and also national authority must develop better support structures for, for cities. And then they stay there together and need to tell to each other every year what we've done, what we've learned, what we should do, what kind of uh, what we committed, how did we done. So, so it's also accountability. It's not only, okay, we sign something and put the paper somewhere in, uh, in the shelf. So, so it's, a, it's also a celebration, celebration of, uh, uh, of all the work that is done. And also that politicians are, of course, like it's a high risk sometimes to talk about that, okay, so we are working with climate transition. I don't know if you have it in Spain, but in Sweden, we have more and more of uh, some con con um, some controversy and some conspiracy theories about 15-minute cities. 
And I, it is like uh, first as a, as a beginning, it was hard to imagine that 15 minute cities would be so controversial thing, but we have it more and more, you know, this 15 minute city concept. So now people, now I started to feel as a politician. So people are calling me to my mobile phone and shouting at me that I am like with a kind of educated person want to close to lock in citizens in in their neighbors and the, how can i like how could i proceed with this uh like whatever type of person i am which is which is very very weird but that's that's true so 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 then as politicians of course they're having a lot of pushbacks and uh, uh so this is also celebrations of politicians who could uh, still st uh, be strong and and drive the the change and we also like we celebrate a lot viable cities we have a theory like we're using the theory of small wins meaning that you need to celebrate whatever small step you've done and you manage to do something even if it's a small thing so we are celebrating all the time uh, Jaime was with us so it's uh, it's a lot of celebration so so one thing we celebrate uh, every year with this, like you see the signature where the mayors and everybody like signing climate city contract. And we have also something which is called Bible cities champions, people who have a significant role in the mission work. And you see Julio is a Bible cities champion, of course. So that's, we are very privileged to collaborate, of course. Uh, so yeah and then every year as i mentioned and we are working on the questions the like how this climate city contracting and climate work uh, and work with the mission should should be developed further and our questions for example about the role of digitalization and digital tools to support the climate transition also how do we involve citizens and different organizations civil society organization how do we fund the finance uh, transition in cities? And also how do we enable systems innovation and reflexive learning? And this we are doing through, through these system demonstrators. Uh, actually just uh, maybe for more for friends who are working with us, now we've done like two thing, new things. We are now started two system demonstrators uh, one led by uh, Lund and another municipality of Lund. Um, and one led by the city of Stockholm. Uh, so it's kind of very large uh, investments in Stockholm. It's on the mobility, on the like climate smart mobility with both electrification and reducing the volume of uh, transport in the city. Um, it's like, um, and also enabling environmental zones creation in cities. And in Lund, it's a connection of uh, the kind of new innovative solution for energy system, both electricity uh, heat and heating, and also uh, mobility. So how do you integrate those systems? So that's very interesting to see. And we also have 15 new today, I think that we would announce, if not yet, uh, 15 new studies where our cities together working on questions of uh, uh, deliberative democracy, citizen assemblies, uh, participatory budgeting, and so on and so forth. Uh, also cities working on climate investment planning and um, involving investments and also regional nodes. It's also for upscaling. So if we cannot work with individual cities, especially smaller cities, can we create the regional nodes with regional actors? So those kind of 15 new efforts we have started from today. Uh, yes. And for us, it's very important also to see, to think from the city level, from the local level, involving many stakeholders, many companies, uh, civil society organizations, universities, to regional level, to national level, and to European level. Also working with smart policy creation, policy labs, policy sandboxes, in order to develop new regulations, new, and also try to contribute to development of European legislation in the field. Yeah, and this is just like a journey, I think that I want to share with you. So, so we, sometimes we are thinking that change is kind of change requires, uh, like those kind of societal changes requires a lot of time and it's very hard to 
to develop this kind of new tools and methods and approaches, mobilize different actors. But I'm very proud of kind of very, very fast development within viable cities that we had. So we started 2017 and we were the more or less conventional program. Uh, so we already had this kind of uh, in mind transformative potential. We had already stakeholders from quadruple helix. And we told that, okay, so we, we will ground our work on transition management uh, series. But what we did, we more or less found projects. So we started with that. But already 2018, we went to Brussels and we've heard that the mission innovation might be launched, might be not, to 2021. And then we decided, uh, so instead of waiting for European Commission to start the mission work, we will develop the mission structure. So we will, we will ourselves decide how this kind of mission calls should look like, what should be done, what instruments should be there. So not waiting for anybody, 2018, we already had the first mission call for the first cities to come in. And then 2019, we've got first nine cities who wanted to be with us with high ambitions. Uh, and uh, so this first call, so nine cities, 2019. Uh, 2020, 2019, in the, in the beginning, we started with nine cities at, at the end of 2019, Julio knows about that. He was a member of the mission board. Also the chairperson from Viable Cities was a mission board. And then the first ideas about climate city contracts were there, but it was about, okay, so should we do some tool which is called climate city contract? And this is for multi-level governance and so on and so forth. And 2019, at the end of the year, we decided we will not wait until might be European Commission will develop climate city contract. We will develop climate city contract in Sweden. So at the beginning of 2020, we went to our cities and say, hello, we are going to develop together with you climate city contract. We need together with you to think what kind of instruments you need and for what. Should we design it together? And let's add design this instrument so that we are ready to sign the first um, climate city contracts already at the end of the year, the 10th of uh, December and 10th of December, because it's just a day prior, uh, 9th of December, because it's a day prior to uh, the Nobel Prize. So one day before the Nobel Prize celebration, we will sign climate city contracts. And because we already had a lot of trust from politicians, from mayors, from civil servants, they say, okay, let's try. You never come with bad ideas. So then we come, we, we went to our national authorities saying to them, okay, now together with uh, cities, nine cities, we want to develop climate city contracts and you need to sign it and you need to develop kind of the measures, how you can better support the cities with funding, with regulations, with investments, uh, and with um, innovation portfolios. And they say, no, 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 mm -hmm. that's a kind of bad idea. We're already collaborating, we are doing so many things. It's not necessary to take another instrument. Then we say, okay, in April, 25th of April or 26th of April, nine mayors come to sign the letter of intent that at the end of the year, it will be climate city contracts. You can also come on the 26th of April and sign together with mayors, or you can decide not to do that. All agencies came and signed. Okay, so you have a pressure of nine mayors from the largest cities of Sweden, and it's kind of not uh, so, um, yeah. So it's, 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 it's still power in, in, in Sweden. So at the end of 2020, we signed the first climate city contract. And now both cities and agencies believe that this is a very good idea. So they can work uh, kind of um, structural and then they could do interesting things together and uh, having a bigger impact. So this was possible. But 2021, other cities were saying, okay, Olga, you created uh, exclu exclusive club of nine cities. Now we also want to be part of it. 
So we need another, we made another call and 14 more cities came in. So we've got 20, 23 cities. Uh, and then 2021, you could compare 20, 2018 and 2021, European Commission came with a call. And then 2022, 112 cities arrived. And just this year, for several weeks ago, first 10 cities sign climate city contracts. And I should just congratulate you, uh, our Spanish friends, that uh, the whole of five of out of 10 first cities signed the climate city contract and got the European label are uh, Spanish. And only one tiny one, but our capital Stockholm, uh, they also signed uh, and got the label. And now we, yesterday we've been talking to uh, Madrid um, so that they want to have a like great collaboration and visibility. Only two in Europe, only two, uh, um, um, capitals sign climate city contracts. So then they need to have some visibility together. So you can do things fast, even in these rigid structures and national agency and cities, if you work smart, yeah? Okay, uh, yeah, and then, so when we are talking and thinking about our history, we see the three layers of mission-driven work. As I mentioned, we started with uh, this lever level on the bottom, and this is transformative, it's a project, yeah? So it's uh, cross-sectorial initiatives and projects that we funded. They have transformative potential, but these are still projects, yeah? Then on the middle, we have a layer, which was called building the transition capacities of cities. And this is our 23 cities that are working together with the transition lab, learning from each other, uh, and uh, creating the innovative te innovation team, the transition arenas, new, new ways of working with uh, the citizens, uh, involving their companies and so on and so forth. And then on the third level is a policy development. So it's a policies, uh, it's also uh, um, um, uh, possibilities to like climate investment plans, uh, climate city contracts, and all these kind of tools that are helping us to uh, create policy and also structures to drive the change. So, and then what we are doing in Viola Cities, we're also going it's like for, from one level to another, but this is a middle level that allows us to, to kind of, to bring this kind of together as a transformative portfolio and also make experimentation with policy, development of new policy and investment mechanism. So this middle level is very important, but without this at all the levels, we, we cannot drive the transition. So this is how we are working. And then I think that we in Sweden, we are learning a lot from the world and particularly we are learning a lot from you from Cities 2030. So we've been very privileged to host uh, some of you there, like Jaime worked for us and with us um, for some half a year. We had uh, Miguel and uh, we are privileged to have a glimpse of uh, Julio <laughs> sometimes. So, it's, uh, so we are learning a lot and the collaboration with Cities 2030 and you guys is uh, totally is essential for us. We are talking about uh, co-legitimation that kind of we could always refer to what you are doing. You could refer for what we are doing and then it's not something special or just like one thing. So we can show them scaling up. So then, uh, so by work, working with our cities in Sweden and uh, like your eight cities, the old slide should be now 20, no? Uh, and, and then 112 in Europe, also together with you. So we had the idea, okay, if we have our sister organization in uh, Spain, uh, Cities 2030, then we want to have also city, like uh, sister organization in Ukraine. So it was my idea because, uh, yeah, of course, like coming from Ukraine with these terrible circumstances of the war, uh, it's, um, yeah, so this is where my heart is. Uh, at the same time, actually, honestly, uh, the idea for 
Unicities, our Ukrainian project came before the war. It was like that time, it was only, okay, so we, we are doing this in Spain, in Sweden, in many European countries. Why can't we do similar things in, in Ukraine? And how can we support Ukrainian universities with that tra transformative potential? Because both Bible cities and cities 2030 are, like, came from universities, as I say, like very bottom up. So how can we help Ukrainian universities to develop a similar program and uh, uh, efforts? Uh, but things changed. Uh, and this is kind of this what the like projects that we submitted a, a week before the war. Uh, so I'm looking at the transformative potential of Ukrainian universities toward climate neutral and sustainable cities. So one week before the war, we applied to Erasmus Plus program. Um, and then the work came. Uh, but uh, like first is the partners. So most of the partners are present here. We have four universities, two from Kiev, uh, one from uh, Kharkiv, and one from Chernihiv. We have also uh, association of uh, Ukrainian cities. Uh, Yula and uh, Natalia, you will also talk today and then we also have connection um, the urbanist uh, architects organization uh, and uh, and then we also have uh, association of engineers of energy efficient technologies of ukraine so uh, so we brought this consortium together in order to 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 start to design activities towards uh, also towards the mission yeah, and this is uh, this is a part of the family. This is our office in the, in Sweden, level cities. So it's part of our Unicities family in our kitchen. And I hope I will see some of you also there. So you're very welcome when you're in Stockholm. So you should uh, contact me or Jaime. So get address and uh, get some coffee on our balcony. Not during winter time. I mean, maybe like during winter time when it's sunny, you still can, can come there. Yeah. And then, as I mentioned, the, the war came and uh, the um, reality of the country very different. Uh, and then we were thinking about, okay, uh, when we've got to know that the project is funded, then the question is what is kind of, how can we work in this context of the war? Uh, where the kind of, Everything is uh, tragic and, and unusual. Uh, and then what we found together with the partners that we can connect our work more closely to uh, the kind of aspiration of green recovery of Ukrainian cities. So it's not like climate neutral cities, yes. So the climate targets are still there and so, but the most important is like, how do we build back better? And this is what is the slogan in Ukraine now. So how do we, how can we imagine still a better future for Ukrainian cities of Ukrainian people? And also how do we not just like recover, like if it was a house, it will be another house, but how do we, how can we build back better and the green future? So this is the aspiration of our project now in Ukraine. And we are, like very happy to collaborate, of course, with Cities 2030. So I would finalize, like just, uh, I think that you would hear more from my great Ukrainian colleagues, but just starting to work, it's again, it's our team uh, in Bible Cities and Ukraine uh, in Stockholm, in, again in our office. And um, so, so some of the learnings that we are taking both like working with viable cities, but also like starting to work with Ukraine, that the building collaboration is a gradual process. And then uh, you need to build trust and it takes time. You also need to leverage on strengths. We all have different strengths. So we need to find it. So we should align our goals and share interest. So it's a mutual benefit and mutual development. Uh, then also I think that we have our ideas about, like I have my ideas how like this development in Ukraine could be, but uh, actually what we need to train more is a deep listening 
uh, and the deep listening, like to truly grasp what does the needs, because I could imagine what the Ukrainians, the Ukrainian city needs, but it's the Ukrainian cities knows bet better what are their needs. And uh, talking to Yula, Natalia, and also talking to Ukrainian cities, I hear that some of uh, capacity building pro programs are so offered by many, many donors, maybe not as attractive as we believe because of some reasons. So we need to really to design this kind of supporting measures from the needs. Also, it's very much about mutual learning rather than one-way collaboration and also long-term collaboration. What I want to see more and more is it kind of, as we are very proud in Ukraine of what we have, and what, for example, we have a very strong IT sector. So uh, we have, um, I think, this is the best and the most advanced in the world, uh, the, the uh, system of e-governance, which is uh, recognized as a kind of most strong as, for example, in uh, Estonia, which is named as one of the kind of forerunners of this. So then uh, we could bring much back, much, a lot back from Ukraine to Europe. Also Ukraine now, we hope that the war will finally be kind of stop soon. And then uh, uh, it will be great possibility just like to like for testing, ex experimenting very unusual solutions because of the scale, because of the scale and scope of the renovation and rebuilding necessary. So I think like, how can we learn from this and how can we bring the knowledge back? Not only, okay, so now we support those Ukrainians. So that's, that's very important. And I think that as me, myself and my friends who are diaspora, both who are like, like long-term, living in Europe and other countries, but also those temporary displaced people, they're very important in building this uh, knowledge and bringing the knowledge back. So I think that as I can see, the diaspora is more most connected and united than I've saw before. So that's also something interesting. And uh, uh, on Thursday, we are going to Valencia. And in Valencia, we have uh, Oksana, uh, Odovic, who is also from, from Ukraine, and she's working in uh, Polytechnic of Valencia, also with questions related to, yes, Ukrainian refugees and questions about gender uh, possibilities uh, and the development uh, also in Ukraine uh, and also city mission in Ukraine. So, so this is, uh, I think that those are some learnings. Yes, with this, uh, sorry if it was too long, uh, so that's what just like some brief uh, introduction to viable cities and our work we are doing. Um, so if you have any questions or comments or reflections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, super. Yeah, nice. So, yeah. Uh, so now we are going to have uh, the second half of the of the session, and at the end we will open the scene for a, for a dialogue with, with all the audience. So uh, now we are um, welcoming uh, Julia and Veronica from the um, Ukrainian Cities Association and from the. Uh, International Science and Technology University, and uh, we'll have a first dialogue, but then uh, many other colleagues uh, will be uh, asked to contribute as well. So uh, please, you can come here, and uh, this micro is for just for the Zoom, so you can use it when when you are speaking, and uh, we're going to let also Olga to lead. The dialogue and ask some some questions. Okay. Thank you. Should I should I take away no, this no. mic? You can continue. Okay. With, with George and okay. for, for yeah, please. Uh, okay. So I hope it works. Uh, yes. So Veronica and uh, 
Uh, Yula, so so nice uh, to be here. So Veronica, you are rector of uh, university in Ukraine, and uh, I could imagine that uh, you have a very different life uh, now than you had before, but you are still a part of the university pro project. So what, what kind of your motivation, what the project is about, like from your perspective? What? Yeah, it's working. Yeah. 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 <laughs> for the, for the... Ah, okay. Um, motivation, uh, you know, you know uh, I like uh, for us, uh, positive for us, uh, every catastrophe uh, has a new opportunity, yes? So in uh, Ukraine we have um, catastrophe, we, <laughs> but we have uh, a, a new opportunity uh, in case of, uh, we understand that we uh, post-war uh, situation, we have to recovery, rebuilding, revitalization, it's very interesting terms now. Um, our cities, our villages, and uh, this is a big, uh, big challenge for our uh, country. And uh, this is experience of a uh, viable city and uh, experience of uh, uh, cities 2030, it's, um, it's very valuable, very important for us. And uh, of course, we understand we we are not uh, really ready to in, in, in implement uh, the um, all steps of uh, European Green Deal. But we have to do. We have to start it. So I guess. Uh, it's a, it's a big motivation for us. Uh, it's big motivation for universities, of course, because it's very interesting that it started from university, and uh, this is the working platform. It's it's very interesting uh, for us, and we hope to implement it in uh, Ukraine. Thank you, and um, maybe Yulia. Uh... So you are representing the huge organization, uh, the yes, Associ Association of Ukrainian Cities. So I know that there are many, many uh, cities and hermadas. Uh, so could you just like describe us what is the what are the what is about your organization and also what are the challenges of cities and hermadas in Ukraine now? Thank you, Olga. Yes, I'm uh, representing today the Association of Ukrainian Cities and. Uh, uh, this is uh, the biggest and the most authoritative organization of uh, non-government organization of local self-government. And um, uh, today we have uh, uh, 1,031 uh, municipalities as our members. Maybe this is not a big or a small uh, number, but uh, uh, in these municipalities, 90% of Ukrainian population is. So it means that we really gather all the country and our main mission, our main task is to protect the interests of local self government, governments at the regional and uh, central level. Uh, uh, so we have been, uh, we have the history of more than 30 years and uh, our, um, our organization was the initiator of decentralization reform. And as uh, the war showed that uh, this uh, reform helped a lot us to uh, survive and to keep the borders of our countries then uh, the war started. And as for today, we continue the work uh, with drafting the laws and uh, uh, active cooperation with the local, uh, with the uh, central level uh, to uh, make effective operations of our communities in the, under the martial law and the continuation of the decentralization reform. Just want to say a, a word that uh, we are you know, the member of such a European organization as the Council of uh, uh, European Municipalities and uh, Regions, and we have started uh, the cooperation with uh, uh, FEM, if I'm uh, pronounced properly. This is the Spanish uh, Federation of Municipalities and Province, and in a week, uh, a delegation of Ukrainian municipalities will arrive to Madrid, and uh, we will have uh, a, a, a study visit and uh, uh, so far we have concluded three partnership agreements with uh, cities like uh, 
uh, Soria uh, Ferrell and uh, Asuke de uh, Enare, sorry if I pronounce, mispronounced it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, we, is, we can say that we have already um, developed projects for development and reconstruction uh, jointly with the Spanish municipality. So, uh, and what I, I should start my uh, speech with that uh, we, uh, so on behalf of all the um, Ukrainian people and uh, municipalities, we would like to say, um, express our um, deep gratitude to the Spanish government, Spanish municipalities for your financial help, for your humanitarian help, and for hosting our uh, people here in uh, your country. And I personally was engaged in the program when uh, uh, province of Galicia uh, welcomed uh, kids from the territories there where the intensive active actions. So we are very thankful for the help. And um, maybe I will know about the problems and challenges. So uh, as for June of 2023, it was recorded that the uh, total uh, amount of destructions estimated uh, more than 1,055 uh, uh, billion uh, euros. Uh, and it is not the final number. And we understand that the sum of uh, uh, the amount of uh, destructions, they are the sum which were caused, uh, it is growing every day. Because uh, the Russian Federation continues to bomb our cities and shell, uh, it happens every day nonstop. And uh, most of the damages, this is uh, more than 40 billion uh, euros. This is the uh, damages of infrastructure, infrastructure, transport infrastructure, roads, roads, airports, uh, buses, uh, uh, fuel uh, stations, and so on. And uh, this, uh, this, uh, so the unprecedented, we can say, damages of infrastructure. This is a great challenge for the municipalities. And uh, the ter territories which now in the uh, which were and which are now in the active uh, war zone, they every day so uh, have this challenge that uh, the roads and everything and uh, infrastructure is distracted. Moreover, they have to uh, to guarantee to ensure to provide the eco evacuation of the people under the uh, shelling. But the territories there, which are in the area, so there is there are no uh, combat actions. They also got such a challenge as a, a very high number of the uh, internally displaced people. In some cities, they have welcomed, uh, uh, so there the population increased in uh, in uh, in ten percent, and it means that uh, this is again the challenge, big, big challenge for the local governments because they have provide. All the necessary challenge, uh, all necessary uh, services like medical, educational, uh, financial, administrative service. So it's a great burden for the local uh, self governments, and nobody can help them. But uh, but only uh, they at the place can uh, think how to manage this. And with every day passing, uh, there are the more and more people become physically challenged, and they come into the category of people with a low mobility. And that's why cities need to, uh, to you know, real inclusion and uh, to involve high mobility into the cities. So if we uh, uh, implemented these complex challenges uh, to make uh, infrastructure during the work you know, uh, workable, so it is Again, so a very high a challenge uh, for the local governments. And uh, uh, Olga told about um, the formula or approach uh, building bad backer. So we have it should take place in Ukraine. We have uh, between among the all stakeholders come to the common decision how to do it. And uh, it means that infrastructure which we will rebuild should be uh, more efficient with. Uh, uh, high quality and durable. Uh, uh, and what is our the main goal? Of course, the, our main goal and dream to win the war as soon as we can. But uh, when the war uh, finishes, and even now, our the main goal to to bring the people back. We don't want our people to live in Europe. And our people, they really want to go home. But if they want to go home, what they need? They need uh, decent uh, public services, and they need works, and they need the places to live. So the lot of challenges, but uh, uh, yes, we hope that with this project, uh, of course, we cannot change uh, Ukraine and will not uh, rebuild Ukraine. But anyway, it can be a push. It can be the change of the minds of the people how to make Ukraine uh, better. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe uh, just a question about this. Uh, our project is actually it's about this university city collaboration. And um, so in Sweden, it's so, so we have like long term traditions that universities are helping cities uh, through research, through education, uh, also kind of support providing the Kind of this neutral platform for conversation for building trust with different actors uh, um, and then i know that maybe ukrainian uh, universities are not uh, like went not so far but there are some examples so uh, veronica do you have some examples from your university or maybe from like i know that today we've discussed uh, some experiences to, uh, yeah because we are private university Mm, I guess uh, maybe the biggest university we have in our consortium, maybe they uh, more. Mm -hmm. They have more experiences? Yeah, with, uh, uh -huh. Municipalities. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we so give a word yeah, to some yeah, other big, friends. Big, yeah. Uh, university in the country. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, but but yeah. Julia, maybe if you say just like, what do you believe that because you work with all this kind of uh, number of universities, uh, number of cities? So do you have any ideas? Or... Well, I definitely believe because in the, you know, what is university? This is the place where we grow the future, the future of, our, of all countries, the future of the world. And if we put the right knowledge in the heads of this young generation, it will guarantee the better future for the countries and for the world. So I really believe in the in this program and the cooperation between universities and cities. Because uh, where will these people go? They will return to their cities, and they will build and uh, uh, re let's say develop the cities in which they live using the knowledge which they uh, get into the in the universities. Yeah. Thank you so much, and we give a big hugs to uh, and Veronica. And maybe, thank you so much. Maybe we invite uh, some uh, other colleagues as well. I don't know, Natalia, maybe you. And uh, I know Alina is somewhere here from Kharkiv, no? We don't have Alina. Uh, maybe you, Natalia? Yep. <laughs> Chernigiv instead of Yes, Chernigiv instead of Yeah. Uh, so, um, Natalia, you're working also as the same association of uh, um, Ukrainian cities. And I know uh, Natalia is telling me, okay, Olga, I'm working with many different things, <laughs> but I'm uh, always uh, like asking Natalia about one very important thing that you're working with, and it's a uh, gender gender equality questions and um, which is very important for Ukraine, I believe. And could you just say a few words about like, you know, what kind of uh, efforts you have and why, okay. what you're doing with this issue? Hello, everybody. I'm um, very pleased to be here and uh, thank you so much for your solidarity and for the help that you give to all of us and to our country and to our people that you host uh, in your country. So uh, we uh, really feel that we are not alone uh, in this battle. Uh, speaking about gender equality issues, uh, indeed, they are very important. And uh, our Association of Ukrainian Cities started uh, working uh, on gender equality issues uh, more than uh, 10 years ago. And we promoted uh, these uh, issues among local governments. And um, at the moment, uh, during the war, uh, really, women are the most vulnerable uh, part, uh, part of the society, and uh, they have a lot of challenges. Uh, and not, not because uh, they uh, had to go to move uh, to other cities and other countries. They are taking care of their small kids. They are taking care of aged people, uh, for instance, their parents or parents of their husbands. Um, of course, most uh, part of uh, men, uh, they are military at the moment. Of course, we have uh, almost uh, 50,000 women among military. Uh, and uh, the number of women constantly growing because uh, women also are fighting for our independence. 
uh, but also uh, women have to uh, find their new jobs in new places. Uh, also, they are volunteering because they have a lot of uh, either friends or their husbands as military. So um, they are volunteering and uh, trying to bring um, the uh, some important things for military from other countries or even uh, in Ukraine. Uh, also, uh, also there is a part of uh, vulnerable population of Ukraine that at the moment are at the occupied territories, and uh, there is a huge, uh, huge amount of uh, um, examples when uh, women and small kids uh, they are raped by the Russian military, and uh, this is uh, the issue of mental health of our uh, kids. The mental health of our women and of course the mental health of uh, the husbands because when they got, got to know about these cases it is a very horrible challenge to the whole family so that's why we uh, we are thinking of some mental health uh, uh, solutions because we have to open some psychological support centers for uh, women, uh, for women that uh, suffered, uh, that faced that uh, uh, violence uh, from from the Russian military. Also, there is a very huge uh, uh, need to build the veteran hubs because, uh, uh, for instance, family uh, that have uh, uh, that has uh, uh, a military, um, they need uh, a special type of support because they need to know how to behave them, uh, themselves uh, when their, uh, their couple uh, comes back for a short period of time to their family and when the war is still in, in their heads. Uh, also, there are many challenges uh, for gender equality issues. Uh, our association is a national coordinator of the European Charter of equality uh, of women and men uh, in local life. This is the uh, the European document that was uh, developed by the Council of European Municipalities and Regions. Yulia already told you that our association is a member of this uh, European association of associations of local governments from many, many countries. So we are promoting this charter. And uh, before the war, we had more than uh, 80 uh, cities, uh, big and small cities that uh, signed this charter. And uh, we believe that um, during the war, they could include uh, to their work plans some specific uh, issues for uh, combating uh, the gender-based violence, just violence, domestic violence, then uh, bringing some new ideas how to how to deal with uh, uh, women who were at war and men who were at war, and uh, actually maybe some, some more mental health programs and so on. Uh, also, uh, during the war, we have a lot of uh, people uh, who were injured, and uh, so now, now they became, unfortunately, people with disabilities. And this is what we should include into the programs of city development. Uh, and for instance, I have a bracelet, uh, which is called Unbroken. There is a, a project uh, in uh, one of our cities of Lviv. This is a huge rehabilitation center, which is built for people, for women and men and civilian and military people. And uh, this is... Uh, what we do need to have in, in many different uh, cities throughout Ukraine, because unfortunately there are a lot of people that uh, suffered because of the war, and now they do not have uh, hands or uh, legs or, or some other uh, uh, severe circumstances uh, they face in their lives. So that's why we really uh, have a lot of challenges. Also, uh, for climate change issues, uh, of course, uh, uh, the territory of Ukraine is polluted uh, with the uh, military, with the uh, remnants or uh, chemicals uh, of the weapons. So that's why uh, really our environment suffers because of the war. Uh, so uh, in this case, we really should think how to cope with that. 
And at the moment, uh, Ukraine uh, is the most uh, mined territory, I think, in the world, yeah. because uh, it, uh, some experts say that it, it may take us more than 50 years to demine the territory, which is uh, at the moment uh, temporarily occupied by the Russian. So we have a lot of work to do, uh, but we believe that uh, by uh, with joint efforts, we could really cope with this evil. Uh, so please don't stop, because uh, um, if you help Ukraine, you help yourself. Because if, uh, if you wake up in the morning and you hear the sounds of war, it is very scary. And it's horrible when, uh, when kids are going downstairs or uh, are going down the table when they hear just a small sudden sounds. This is really horrible to, uh, to live in such a reality. So that's why please don't stop. And thanks again for your support. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, so, uh, Natalia, but I am thinking, okay, so if we go to some uh, kind of a little bit of a positive note, <laughs> yeah. so if we have uh, uh, some experiences from Chernigiv, how do you have some experiences how university is working with municipality or Chernigiv is the city of Chernigiv? Could you share with us some of those? Yeah, thank you. So, okay, I will try to be the sunshine. <laughs> uh, so, basically, I think we are lucky in terms of being a small city. So, so far in Spain, I've been to three cities. So, that's Madrid, Barcelona, and Valladolid. And if you compare Chile with one of them, so that's another. The old, small, um, in some parts conservative, but at the same time evolving in various ways. And at our university, there are only two universities. Oh, sorry, our city, only two universities. So our university, Geneva Tech National University, is the largest. And so um, we have been developing cooperation with our municipalities since, uh, I guess, like like real cooperation, okay, uh, since uh, 2011. So we had um, a program that was called University in the Life of the City, which meant that um, we tried to get involved into different activities of our local self-government and different expert groups they were collecting in different councils. They were, um, felt, I mean, inviting different stakeholders. Um, we were trying to help the city with developing different of its policies, like the transportation system of the city, um, measuring the emissions in the city, so all, all of that kind. Um, and we were also trying to invite representatives of local government to our projects, to our initiatives, to our conferences, roundtables, just to build this um, two-way communication and to establish some interpersonal links and some trust. I can't say it uh, went all that wonderful, but being the sunshine, I can say that I guess we've done a great job. And um, with the re reform of uh, decentralization, when local municipalities received more powers and more finances and more authority, um, we changed this program into the university in the life of the region, because nowadays we are more, we are getting more and more in contact, not with the city uh, self-government, but with the regional municipalities and, and villages and, and their self-government. And um, we are actually uh, implementing several projects or social action projects um, to support them in their development, because what we've seen is that um, receiving all these opportunities, local small municipalities still lack some expertise that the university has and our teachers have um, to empower them to use these opportunities. Um, so basically, this was the work that we started before the war and that we are now, now continuing. Yeah, so 
I guess in Chinihi, where everyone knows everyone. <laughs> so our cooperation with the local government is quite positive. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And if we have some more minutes, maybe I could, uh, yeah, that we have. Maybe we can. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. I just wanted to invite one more person, uh, Alina. Maybe you could come. Uh, I can stay here. It's, it's fine. Okay. So, yeah. So, we are so the women. Yeah. yeah. The women power. So, uh, I, I we had very nice conversation. You are coming from Kharkiv, and we've heard how Kharkiv was. Um, of course, bombed and uh, kind of a lot of um, uh, terrible news are coming. Uh, so, uh, and you are teaching. Yes. Yeah. So you explained to me like how the teaching during the war time uh, in the place where it's 40 seconds. Uh, so it's the, the um, so the 40 seconds from the start to the bombing, so the, you, you don't have time to, to go to the safety room or so. So how, how the teaching processes are working under the circumstances? Uh, mostly online. In general, we are trying to uh, save our community. We are trying to uh, continue educational process. That's why the best option is to continue online. Definitely, it's the safest way to continue education but this year uh, we decided uh, we were allowed by the ministry uh, to have some combination of online and offline educational process and there are many students who decided uh, to try this option to be uh, in this students community to attend university and to have some uh, lessons online and we are so happy that there are many students. We were surprised even. Uh, as for me, I, I thought that, oh, it will be one group, 20%, 25 but no, there are 10 groups for one faculty. It's a huge amount of students. And we are proud of our students, how brave they are, <laughs> definitely. Uh, and uh, starting from the second year of uh, studying uh, all students are online but we are trying to somehow to build this process build this communication definitely it's more difficult for teachers uh, to build this connection between teachers and students online it's more difficult but we are still <laughs> still vertical <laughs> we are trying to continue and we believe Everything will be okay. Haku and Haku will invite all of you after everything will be finished, after the war finish. So thank you. Believe in the best <laughs> future. Should we open for some questions? Yes, so thank yeah, you maybe. so much for your intervention yes? and thank you so much for your correct. It's I think it's a great example to all of us. And uh, we are running out of time, uh, but uh, this we can have a couple of uh, three questions from, from the audience. So uh, if anyone uh, has uh, something to ask or to say, don't be shy. And uh, if you are too shy, then we will have some time with Sophie and with uh, Closer uh, opportunities for intervention. Can I say something? Of course. And uh, you want to just introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, my name is Elena Botniak, uh, and I'm the crazy mom uh, that took my kids early in the morning and run through all the Europe. And now we live in Barcelona with my kids for two years. Oh, sorry, nervous always. I want all of you to say thank you. In Spain, thank you people for all the love here, the amazing support and help you be my family and Ukrainian people because it's an amazing country, amazing, warm, sunshine people. And 
I think it's an amazing experience for the families and the kids to see how they put uh, the sleep in another country and bring the best experience and then manage your brain after you leave. So thank you for your help. And we are also say always that we are not victims, we are barriers. So we will win. So Salo Ukraini, Glory to Ukraini, Viva Estalia. So, uh, anyone has any other? So, uh, if not, we are going to close the, the session. I want to thank you all for your presence here. And especially, I want to, to thank uh, all our Ukrainian friends for, for this moment that, that we are having together these days are being really incredible. Uh, we are learning a lot. Yeah. I feel really, really. I'm glad to, to have this opportunity. So you will be always welcome here. This is uh, a common house. And of course, it's, it's your house as well. And thank you also, Olga, for, for uh, your inspiration and your uh, clearness and, and all of you who can tell with us and what you to ask. And, uh, and thank you all. And we will continue. Thank you to Monica, which is uh, there with the multitasking, doing very important things, uh, several things at the same time. And uh, and uh, the unlikely dialogues we will continue. We will have uh, more during November and during next uh, year. So thank you so much. And it's a uh, pleasure to have this uh, place to share these experiences and to interact among us. So have a nice uh, afternoon or, or evening. Thank you. Super. Thank you.